I'm Linda Bailey, I'm the Executive Director of NACTO. If I haven't had a chance to personally meet you, I'm so excited everyone's here. Um, I'm just going to give a few brief uh, introductions of our awesome uh, plenary panel we have here. Um, I, I'd like to say these are three state DOT secretaries, um, heads of large agencies, the biggest agency in any state that's working on transportation. Um, and they've all endorsed the NACTO um, street design guide and bike design guide, and we're very excited to have them here. Uh, Lynn Peterson, on your right, um, from Washington State DOT, was the first uh, uh, secretary to sign off on this. Um, <laughs> yay. Uh, Rich Davey from Massachusetts DOT here next to Lynn and Malcolm Doherty, who we honored also on Wednesday night for the same thing, so you know that he also has been a leader on this. So thanks, every, all, all of you, for your leadership on this. Um, and um, we'll be moderated today on this panel talking about um, federal, state, local um, cooperation by so John Sasaki. Thanks for uh, joining us, John. So I want to start off with kind of a not so transportation related uh, question for Richard and Lynn, and that is given the fact that we have the World Series here in San Francisco right now, how are the Mariners and the Red Sox doing? <laughs> well, <laughs> you want to take that? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. That's, that's, that's fine. Now, I, I know that everybody here is uh, kind of involved in the whole transportation idea, but, but every once in a while I, I look at um, YouTube or I just see a piece of video somewhere. Uh, showing traffic in places like China or the Middle East or, or places where transportation seems to be a little bit less organized. My question to you is, with, with what's out there, what's the importance of what you guys do in transportation planning? How would our streets, our roads, our highways look if it wasn't for people working, doing the great work that you guys do? Lynn. You know, the... Um I think the most important thing to keep in mind uh, as we kind of think about where we've been and where we're going is what problem we're trying to solve. Uh, I think that we have uh, either, we've gotten to the point where we've kind of over-regulated and over-built ourselves um, based on a lot of myth. Um, because we didn't know when we started out building the highway system back in the 50s, right? Uh, what was safe and what wasn't safe? So we were really overly conservative about what we were doing. And uh, I, I think that adding a little bit of chaos, like a roundabout, is a good thing, right? Actually putting the decision making into the hands of the folks so that you actually have to communicate with each other or have vehicles communicating to each other. But the, uh, introducing the concept of actually having to make a decision yourself is adding a little bit of chaos back in and it will regulate itself after that. But when we, when we get off an interstate, it, it doesn't all have to look like an interstate. And I think that's where we have to really spend our time is how do we have people communicating to each other on the street, eye to eye, you know, making sure that they're looking out for each other. And that to me sounds like more conscious travel mm -hmm. where it's not so robotic, Richard. I mean, sounds how, like how a do new we? Book. Yeah. Conscious travel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, so, so many people in America are so focused on everything else, their cell phones, their mm -hmm. you know, the kids in the back seat or whatever. And, and if you are more conscious, I would think that that keeps you safer on the roads. I'm still upset about the World Series comment. So <laughs> I, I just have to say. The Red Sox have done fine uh, recently. We are the defending they champions, have done, yes, but yes, uh, yes. we did not uh, win many games this year. Um, <laughs> so, no, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, one, at least in, in Massachusetts, uh, you talk about you know, roads. Many of the roads that we're talking about in the cities that for Boston and Somerville here, for example, were cow pasture roads, which we are now <laughs> attempting to you know, have 60-foot buses go down and have cars being able to, to tra traverse through, never mind pedestrians and bicyclists. So uh, there are enorm enormous challenges, I think, particularly in our older legacy cities um, in Boston, I, I think is among those who you know, struggle with that. On the robotic question or the, or the attention question, there is no doubt, with all due respect to everybody in this room, instant gratification is what folks want in transportation. When I became secretary, actually, before I became secretary, I ran the MBTA in Boston, and my parents gave me a clock uh, as a gift, which says, you're only as good as your last rush hour. Okay, these are my parents, everyone. Allegedly, they love me. Allegedly, they love me. 
<laughs> and so for our customers, I think, anywhere in the United States, it's that instant gratification question. And that, in part, I think leads to a lot of the conversations you have heard uh, on the last couple of days about pedestrian and bicycle safety and roadway safety and bus safety. Uh, because we are just, particularly in the Northeast, uh, we are so anxious to get to wherever we're getting to. Um, and it, we, it really calls upon us to have a moment of just <coughs> calm, I suppose, uh, when it comes to uh, understanding um, how we're interacting. Malcolm, it doesn't get much more legacy than <coughs> San Francisco. I mean, this city was built you know, with these streets this wide 100, 150 years ago. It was really meant for horses and, and carriages, and people drive you know, kind of crazy in a lot of parts of the city. How, how do you approach that kind of change? Well, yeah, I mean, you touched on several subjects I'd like to elaborate on. You talked about chaos versus organized, and if you took somebody from Nebraska and put them in San Francisco, I think it's all relative what is chaos and what is organized. Um, but, you, but in San Francisco, I grew up on the East Coast, and something you said about San Francisco uh, resonates with me from the East Coast. Most of the cities on the East Coast were developed into big cities before the invention of the car. Mm -hmm. That is not necessarily true in California. Most of the cities in California grew into big cities after the invention of the car, and to this day we're trying to make up for that. San Francisco is a little bit unique. I don't know that I put it into that category because the Bay Area is constrained geographically by the Bay and the ocean, therefore it's consolidated, and they've got that going for it. So. And another thing you said at the, at the very beginning about the importance of what we do, I think this is not the importance of what everybody does in this room uh, from a transportation standpoint. If the transportation system is not working, it, it affects the economy and it affects the quality of life of the people that are trying to use that transportation system. And that's all modes of the transportation system. That's really uh, what is important about the transportation system is if it's not working, in an integrated and efficient matter. It affects the economy, it doesn't enhance the economy, and it affects our quality of life. <clears throat> Linda, this is about getting everybody to work together. Mm -hmm. How important is that? It's really critical. You know, I think um, something we always say in New York is New York City is one city, and I would have these conversations with the state when I was working there, and then I would say, well, New York State is also one state. We're all part of New York State, so don't forget. And um, I think that, um, I think it has to go both ways. I think cities have to see, you know, how states are dealing with like a really wide flung network when they're coming into the city and working with it. But states also have to start to see that uh, increasingly we have a very urbanized population in the U.S. and increasingly what they're serving is a network of cities in a way and less of a uh, kind of a Thomas Jeffersonian, you know, like quilt of, of one farm, you know, one square mile, you know, farms across the country. So you know, we have to think about that from both ends and kind of come together to build the new uh, cities that people want to live in. And, and so from a state perspective, how interactive are you guys with the cities? I mean, and, and how do you foster those relationships? Well, I mean, in California, I mean, we're somewhat unique in that, uh, I mean, we don't have one major metropolitan area. I mean, we've got no less than five or six major metropolitan areas. And even if you use the Bay Area, the Bay Area is one mega region, but they've got three different cities that all have a, uh, you know, a, you know, have their own little uh, personalities between Oakland, San Francisco, and, and San Jose. So as a state, we have a responsibility of travel interregionally, but then we, we connect at the urban centers. And when we connect at the urban centers, are we going to carry that interregional mentality into those urban centers, or are we going to solve transportation problems or challenges in the urban centers with urban solutions that are proper for that context. And I think that's the one thing that we have to navigate. Um, but the Bay Area, Los Angeles, San Diego, Sacramento all have their unique characteristics. And I think we need to work very closely uh, with, the local, with the local cities as to what they want to accomplish and what they want to accomplish and make sure it's compatible with our threads of the transportation system that go through their urban setting. <clears throat> Do you guys have the same kinds of challenges with all these different kinds of attitudes across your states? The governance in Massachusetts is, is probably much different than the West, right? So it's much more city and town based. Uh, we had a small town, Arlington, I think Massachusetts, which may be up here, uh, which <laughs> took a, a, um, a town meeting vote about whether or not they would have a cycle track in Arlington. 8,000 people of about a 35,000 uh, person town showed up and voted, and it basically got tied. <laughs> <laughs> 
I got to break the tie, by the way. <laughs> so we're doing the cycle trip. Um, yeah. but, um, and then for Boston and Somerville, I'll point out, too, it's the tale of, of, of two cities in some respect, which is we have a highway overpass in Boston and a highway overpass uh, in Somerville, uh, both of which we have been talking about knocking down and bringing back to grade. And in Somerville, um, I think they would rename the town after us because they're so happy. But in Boston, in the neighborhood, it has been very, very controversial. Um, and in that instance, again, I think that's where the, the cities used us a bit, which was okay from a political perspective, uh, to get the right result going. Uh, and in Boston, we're doing the same. So I think in, in some respects, we're able to work with our cities from a political perspective and ultimately get to the right, you know, have a lot of public process, of course, but get to the right result uh, that they can support. So that's been one unique place where I think Massachusetts, we've been very effective with our municipal partners. So when you say the right result that they can support, the right result comes from you? No, the right result <laughs> was coming from them ultimately. Okay. No, no, right, absolutely. Right. Um, certainly the right result from our policies, no doubt about it. Uh, but you know, change is hard even if you are reversing. I mean, as you said, there's you know, a lot of folks in here who are certainly going to be on the same page as as we are, and we're talking about uh, some of these issues, but certainly there are those in neighborhoods who fear, uh, who fear that change, um, and who fear what could come, uh, traffic, gentrification, et cetera, if we make some of these changes. So um, again, I think the, the cities in particular can help, uh, we can help them uh, from a political perspective move the agenda forward. Lynn, you have the same challenge, more like San Francisco, California, or do you have more like Massachusetts? You know, uh, it's a very diverse state. It's very large, Washington. Um, and the way I look at uh, the different urban areas within the state, uh, whether it was in Oregon for the last 20 years or in Washington, is that every city is in a different develop stage of development. So the issues that they're facing at that moment are unique to them, but they're not unique to the development of cities over time. And so you have to really go in and, and talk to them where they're at in the stage of their development. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we have the flexibility so that we don't just have 10 products. Because if we just have 10 products that we offer, then, uh, then you've got folks demanding one of those 10 products when we actually uh, need to figure out how to solve the problem. And if you haven't defined the problem right of where they are at and what's politically acceptable in the range of that, and you just plop down one of your 10 products, you are not going to be the most liked agency <clears throat> because uh, you haven't actually sat down and actively listened to what they need at that moment. And it could be that they just needed a $100,000 fix, not the $20 million fix. And if we only provide $20 million fixes and we aren't able to actually put out safety projects at the $100,000 level, tomorrow we have to wait for the big transportation package to be passed by the legislature, then we aren't doing our job. Linda, uh, explain just in a nutshell what the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide is. Um, it's really trying to get to the place where we connect the vision um, that I think a lot of community leaders have, um, electeds, but also um, actual community leaders, people who are not maybe elected, but speak for the community, um, to um, what I think transportation professionals can offer. Um, to communities and um, kind of a new vision for how cities can work with their streets. Um, we always like to point out that um, streets in most cities make up 80% of all public space. Um, so if we're not really thinking about those as spaces that people interact with the city, the city in, um, then we're missing out on a big opportunity. And so it's really trying to connect and it's a very visual guide. Um, so it's connecting everybody through that but also getting into, I'd say, you know, enough detail that we can kind of actually talk about these are real <laughs> projects that could really happen. And a practitioner who's gonna go out and do a CAD drawing of it can actually, you know, know what you're talking about when you say this is really great. Yeah, and so um, we're really excited to be, be able to put that out there. Um, I would say that the, uh, the interstate system is one of those amazing engineering feats of the modern, of the last century and this one too, I guess. Um, it's, it's just these total amateurs, you know, are out there driving 80 miles an hour half the time, 
within a few feet of each other, and it's, it's actually mostly very safe. <laughs> like, I know you guys know <laughs> this, shockingly. Um, and that's really the product of a huge amount of work, and you know, like these agencies and the other state DOTs and the Federal Highway have been working at this for 50 years. Um, I really think we have to just take that same kind of concentration and idea and go to the city streets and figure out how do we make those safe, how do we make them really work for cities, really work for the economy, and really just work to get everything we want out of our lives. You know, it's really a big picture thing when the city has to think about this stuff. 80 miles an hour, is that how fast people go down five to our, towards Los Angeles? <laughs> I think it might be a little bit faster than that. Um, so these are three, these folks represent three of the states that have actually endorsed the NACO guide. Mm -hmm. um, so starting with California, how is uh, your department implementing flexible street design uh, standards across the state? So when you were the first state to endorse, were you the second? I believe so. Yeah, so I waited till a NACTO event to do mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually held off and Massachusetts snuck in or else I would have been the second state. But anyway, Not that there's any kudos to them. Between Very us. Competitive. Very competitive. <laughs> and then they called me up and guilted me into doing it. That's not really true. <laughs> they did. Um, well, I mean, I endorsing the, uh, the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide and the Bike Guide were very important steps for us. Um, probably the first significant step we took was back in 2012 when we started incorporating our complete streets principles into our highway design manual. And that's been an iterative process. In fact, we've updated our highway design manual again even this month to start to incorporate those in there. We uh, updated our, our uh, complete streets principles with a Main Street California guide uh, in late 2013. Um, and now we're taking all those things and we're reviewing our other guidance, the highway design manual and things like that, to update those to be consistent with some of the other principles in these other guidance materials. That's actually, for me, the easy part. Changing the, if you have the political will and the foresight to do that, changing the manual is the easy part. Mm -hmm. The hard part is changing the 20,000 people's decision-making process that you've trained very well for decades to be thinking outside the box that these are viable options, they are part of your toolbox to solve transportation challenges, thinking about all modes, right? Not just how many cars can I pump through this corridor? Um, and so once you provide the leadership of changing the guidance material, endorsing things like the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide, now you have to, you have to make sure that, that you're providing the training and permeating that down through the department such that the decision makers are using that material, they are thinking about all users of the transportation system, and then your decision making is reinforcing that that's the way we're going to look at things. You two agree entirely, don't you? Absolutely. Ditto. <laughs> Whatever Mel <Malcolm's laughs> said. I think for Massachusetts, it really started when MassDOT was born. So our organization is coming up on our fifth birthday, actually, at the beginning of next month. And Massachusetts, has anyone heard of the Big Dig? None of you, great. So, <laughs> so Massachusetts uh, has a, unfortunately a long history of, uh, at least with our uh, citizens, a fairly negative view of transportation and what it means, the Big Dig being a, a large part of that. And so our governor, Governor Deval Patrick, uh, created MassDOT five years ago and took the, the transit agency, the MBTA, which is the largest in Massachusetts, the fifth largest in the country, we move about 1.4 million people a day. Uh, our old turnpike and our highway uh, division, a small aeronautic group, and our registry of motor vehicles, and brought them all under one umbrella. A lot of what California has been doing, a few other states have been trying to bring these bureaucracies together. So now we're a 10,000 person organization as opposed to an organization that just fought each other for decades, literally. So first you've got to get everybody on board, which we had done, and then it's, all right, what are we doing together? And I think this goes back to your point, Malcolm, which is, well, I love my bridge engineers, and I love my, my guys in charge of, of our bus operations. We move buses, we build bridges. No, we move people. We move people. And making it a more centric, people-centric business, which sounds so simple in transportation, but it is not. That is the core of our focus. And so that's why we adopted our green dot policy. That's why we adopted our complete streets policy. That's why we adopted safe routes to school. We're using federal highway money, safety money, for bike and pedestrian safety programs. We're the first state to do that this year. And it was only natural uh, to adopt the NACTO guidelines as well. When we saw them, we said this fits exactly into what our core uh, business is at MassDOT, which is to be uh, really a green dot. Um, and that's a policy that our governor articulated. So 
it's, a, it's been a long journey for us to get to this point where it was only natural. Uh, but four or five years ago, um, I would be in the back serving you coffee, uh, not talking about what we're doing, <laughs> because we would not have been pretty proud of where we were. But uh, we've come a long way in five years. Just to build on uh, the comments, I, there were two hooks coming into WashDOT that I was able to latch onto in order to move this agenda. And one was that WashDOT was kind of on the cutting edge of risk assessment and really started delving down into and helped with the highway safety manual in a big way. So they were able to see how to weigh um, at a very high level. I mean, it's not all 2,200 engineers and all the planners yet, but they. They had started down this direction, so we hooked onto the highway safety manual, we hooked onto risk assessment. The other hook is that every agency, um, that, that every state agency that works with the local jurisdictions does have examples where this decision making worked. That there were individuals within both organizations that worked together to actively listen, to, to define the problem, and actually come up with some innovative way Right within the constraints of the city, within the constraints of the, the state politics and the literal physical constraints, what you're trying to accomplish, we latched onto those. So when you go onto our practical solutions, practical design website now, we have a listing of the projects that show our folks doing a great job. And we promote that all over and especially internally. These are our practical design stars, right? <clears throat> um, I watch Design Star a lot. So <laughs> um, th that, that's, that's a, a really biggie. But I think for me, going around and talking to, I'm, I've gotten to 2,000 out of the 6,800 folks within the organization to talk about this in a big way, because it's completely changing the way we do project development. Um, it's examples. And the biggest example that I have that, that gets either elected officials, business folks, our own folks, um, understanding where we're going is that how many of you know uh, what the assumption is be behind the curve advisory speed signs? So we're based it on the friction factor right to the punchline of a Model T Ford. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it doesn't feel like you need to actually go the speed that we're giving you the advisory on, right? You go a lot faster and if you tell me you do go that speed, I'm going to call you a liar because there's nobody that's going that speed. <laughs> but we've kind of advanced since then, right? I mean, the, how our cars behave, we have wider wheelbase, we have uh, innovative tire technology. We aren't riding like five feet up in the air in a Model T Ford, we're actually two and a half feet off the ground, right? So everything is different about the car and then how you actually design the roadway also accomplishes a lot. So we have a lot of safety features that we didn't have and so we better darn update those assumptions so if it, it, and that's across the board for all of the modes and how the modes interact, right? So this is, this is the hook that really gets people thinking and I need as many of those examples as you possibly can give me and all of us that are trying to move this agenda forward so it's not just moving the internal, it's moving the consultants, it's moving the businesses that are really defining some of our political agendas and then the elected officials so that you can get your head around it. Because if, if it's just about, just about you know, one mode or the other, we're still stuck in the same conversation. So how can state DOTs work better with cities to help them develop safe, economically diverse, beautiful you know, communities for everybody? I'm planning on just giving all my highways to the cities and then they can do <laughs> good. <laughs> <Excellent>. <laughs> Which highway does San Francisco get? Uh, 101, which is actually Van Ness and Lombard Street, is a, is a difficult one. Um, but again, you've got to have continuity between that uh, to and through, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's a perfect example of a city street that actually happens to be a state highway and is a freeway on either side. Um, and you've got to try to figure out, we have, a, we have an obligation to try to figure out how to get to and through those major metropolitan areas. City of San Francisco has some other ideas of what they want to do with that, and they're very good ideas. And that's where you have to kind of merge, um, you know, the urban setting uh, with the objection of, uh, ob uh, with the goal of trying to move people uh, along that corridor. And it's a balance. So you've got to collaborate with the cities. We've gotten cities, counties, RTPAs, MPOs, we've gotten very good at collaborating with them on how to fund projects. We've gotten very good uh, about how to collaborate with them on how to deliver projects. And I think the next uh, horizon for us is to make sure we're collaborating on 
the right scope of work for that thread of a state transportation system through an urban setting? I think it's about money. I think that that's a great way to incentivize cities uh, in the kind of direction that a state policy would want to go. So again, my friends from Boston and Somerville who are here, we're investing a ton of money in both of those cities, uh, in part because they're you know, it wholly adopting the kinds of policies that, we, um, that we're advocating and we care for. I mean, Somerville is a great example. I hope you have an opportunity to see the display outside that Somerville has provided. But we're, we're building a light rail system, extending a light rail system into the city of Somerville, which has right now, I think it's the 15th most densest city in the United States. It only has about 10%, uh, 15% of its population within walking distance of a transit station. When we're done, almost 90% of the city will be. It will be transformative uh, for Somerville. Um, and that's been something, um, and that was something promised in 1989 by Governor Dukakis, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> 25 years later, we're delivering on it. Um, but it's, uh, it, that has been, I think, extraordinary. And then working, again, with Boston, for example, of which I am also a resident, too. So not only do uh, we work closely with them, but, uh, but I myself am a citizen of, of the city, uh, working very closely on a whole host of, uh, of issues. And Boston's a really interesting place because it is, uh, so young and so old at the same time. Um, and the neighborhood politics are very interesting. I remember I was speaking at my neighborhood group, the Back Bay of, of, Mass of Boston, about 18 months ago. Uh, 150 people showed up about transportation. And at the end of my speech, three people shot their hands up. The scourge of the Back Bay are bicyclists. What are you doing about the bicyclists? And it's encouraging them. What do you think? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, it's outrageous. So it, it's, the, it's, it's really the sort of change question. And I, I guess it goes back to what I was suggesting earlier, which is it's not only the funding, but I think the state can help support um, cities when they're moving in directions and areas that can be controversial. So, but look, I, I think the three of us, it's a delight. You have Seattle, you have Boston, you have places like San Francisco and Los Angeles. I mean, you, you have a very enlightened, you know, we are able to work with, I think, very enlightened folks in the states that, uh, the respective states that we work, and that makes it easier. I, don't, I think I would probably have a harder time if I were a state transportation secretary in another state, uh, but being able to work with places like Boston and Cambridge and Somerville and Amherst, it, it's, it is uh, easier than I think people would think with, with that collaboration. You mentioned 1989, 25 years to get that project all done. I think it took 20 years or so to get the Bay Bridge. You, you had to go there. Uh, I, did, I did have to go there. I did. It, it took more than 20. <laughs> well, so, I mean, that, that seems to be an, an issue the DOTs face across the country. I mean, it, it really is. It, you, a lot of times, government just doesn't move that quickly. And so, so to, that, to that point, um, in order to define success for all of us at the city, county, regional, state, right, we have to change the performance measures. And if all we're doing is saying that it's a level of service issue, a volume to capacity, we have to meet these very narrow, tailored uh, uh, standards and, and performance measures and not what are the economic uh, things that we're trying to achieve on the ground because transportation is not the end all be all. I know that's not, this is not the place to say that, but <laughs> it is an enabler, it is a tool for economic development and, and for land development. And the number one commodity in an urban area is land. And we were talking about 80% of that, but it's like 30, 30 plus part of our urban environments are our transportation itself. So if you just continually take up space in the urban area with the transportation, you don't end up with land uses to serve anymore. So that's the conversation, right? What does success look like and what are those other performance measures? If we don't have that conversation, to your point, these projects take longer. Because you are constantly going back, right, and trying to figure out why did that conversation go wrong? It's because we only provided these products, we only had one or two performance measures. One of the first things we did, and it was totally our staff, once I just you know, started enabling, we have an annual congestion report. How many of you have heard of the Washington Gray Notebook? It's like, yeah. It, it measures everything, but doesn't really analyze anything. But it, it <laughs> we have a lot of data. Um, but it basically, we changed our annual congestion report to our, capac our corridor capacity report. And we have reached out to every single other transit agency and every single other jurisdiction to find out what their capacity is within that corridor. Because if they have capacity, then why are we having a conversation about 
continually widening the one highway? Why aren't we talking about the light rail capacity? Why aren't we talking about the bus capacity? Why aren't we talking about the roadway capacity in the parallel and per per perpendicular streets? So it, it's changing the conversation about what is the problem and what is the solution. I want to make one observation too. I think the other challenge we have had in transportation is we're designing for today and not for tomorrow. And the, and, and again, that sounds simple, but uh, with all due respect to the MPOs and, and all the processes that are multi-layered around, uh, my favorite is when folks talk to me and say, Secretary, you know, I've been waiting for 20 years for this project and it's my turn. Like, yeah, but it's not relevant anymore. Yeah, no, I know, I know, but I've been waiting for 20 years. It's my turn. Um, and California's done, we've actually been watching a bit what California has done on project selection as an example, which is... Uh, which I think has been useful and helpful, but I think part of the challenge we all have is thinking about what the future is going mm -hmm. to be. So whether it's autonomous vehicles, and by the way, what does that mean for all the things that we care about? It's right. interesting. There could be some really unintended consequences there. Uh, how are we going to fund our systems in the future? The gas tax, although we just raised it in Massachusetts last year for the first time since and 1989. Probably the last time. Probably the last time because it will be uh, probably irrelevant in 10 or 15 years, certainly as a major funding source. And so you know, we're crafting ourselves to a place where um, we just have to be cognizant and careful. Now, I think also what, what is so exciting about what NACDO is doing is that many would argue that this is the century of the city, um, that the 21st century is the century of the city, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And so some of the most exciting stuff that can occur um, is that down to the person um, on a streetscape in a major city anywhere in the world. So. Um, you know, we have to continue to think about what is to come as opposed to what is today, um, and I think we'll have better outcomes as a result. I want to intercept the floor as it's going back over to you, because I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree. We spend a lot of time and energy solving today's problems, and we're going to continue to need to do that, but we need to be solving tomorrow's problems as well. And I've talked a lot about uh, there are 37 million people in California, and by 2050 they estimate there's going to be 50 million people. And in several different uh, uh, forums of transportation stakeholders, I've said, I hope we are not thinking about trying to move those 50 million people in single occupancy vehicles, because we're not moving 37 million people successfully in single <laughs> occupancy vehicles today. So we're not going to be able to do it with 50 million people, and we need to be solving tomorrow's problems. Every decision and project we make in transportation is responding to demand created by something else. Mm -hmm. And we need to be thinking smarter about how we're going to grow as a state, where those 50 million people are going to be, and how we're going to move them. I mean, the, the high-speed rail system in California is one example about thinking about tomorrow's problems and another transportation option in moving interregionally. But I wholeheartedly agree we need to be thinking about tomorrow's problems while we're scrambling around day to day solving today's problems. Yeah. Richard, Richard, you said something, too, that I caught my attention, and maybe this is kind of insignificant, but you said something to the effect of um, that in 10 to 15 years, the tax that you uh, referred to might be irrelevant. Is that, are you talking about just a, tra a transition away from gas? Yes. Okay. Um, um, so that's, and, is that the projection in this room that in 10 to 15 years, we won't be nearly as reliant on gas? You just started a whole other path. Yeah. <laughs> but go for it. Yes. Excellent. So I'll be quick. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Next question. Uh, no, it's, we certainly need, it, it, and the, the, the debate is happening at the state level, or regrettably, there seems to be no debate at the national level, but um, at least in states, places like Wyoming, uh, which happened to be one of the most conservative states in America, raised its gas tax uh, two years ago by, I think, 10 cents. I mean, people seem to be getting it at the state level, um, at least to invest in infrastructure. With that said, though, we're not thinking about, and we tried to dip our toe in this in Massachusetts last year. Uh, VMT showed up somewhere, and then it was, I think, erased or, or whited out or something in a document we wrote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, it's, you know, that certainly is a question we are adopting. We're the first state, we will be the first state to adopt all electronic tolling in, Mass in the United States, which will be done in about, uh, about 18 months, which I hope sets the table. This is being recorded by Mike? Sure. Um, <laughs> which I hope sets the table then for a real conversation about congestion pricing and about real ring tolling around the metropolitan areas. Um, those are going to happen. Those are really hard conversations to have, but any person who is looking at 10 years from now sees that um, the gas tax, I mean, it can't even cover what we need to do at the federal level. At states, various levels, there are some challenges, but um, 
it's obvious that, and then the unintended consequences, whether it be autonomous vehicles, whether it be alternative um, energy, whether it be the, the kind of um, uh, things that at least we are doing at the state level, which is encouraging more people to do something else other than to be driving. We have a goal in Massachusetts to triple the, the mode, uh, triple the walk, uh, bicycle and transit use by 2030. I mean, these are all excellent policies that are going to undercut the, fi the funding structure that we have in place. So we have to think about what that means in the future, too. So, and again, I think the best work that's happening right now is at the state, uh, the state level with cities to think about what that means. Yeah, the gas tax is a, is a uh, it, it has served us well for a lot of years, but it is a methodology to pay for transportation that is dying of old age. Yeah. Uh, not only for maintaining the infrastructure that we have, which we absolutely need to do, it's a significant source of funding for uh, dis different transit operations. We are consuming less fuel in the countries in each of the states. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing, unless you're dependent on it to take care of the transportation system. So it has served us well, but it's dying of old age. It is not a successful model going forward, so we're gonna have to explore different ways to invest and pay for transportation, not because we just need to build big projects, because it's, it's, it's critical for our economy and our quality of life. We're gonna explore and do a pilot for a road user charge. The trick is when, when, when one of those terms gets a negative connotation like VMT, just change it to road user charge. It's the same thing, but you just change the name. And then when that one gets a negative connotation. Happy unicorn charge. Start calling it mileage based <laughs> user fees. Just keep moving, but it's the same thing. We're gonna explore it. Is that where we're gonna end up? I don't know, but when we're done with that pilot, we're gonna be a much more informed group to figure out how are we gonna adequately invest in transportation in all modes. So that's how the government gets people to fall for new taxes. <laughs> Just keep changing the name. Uh, right, okay, well, right. they're fees now, right? They're <laughs> yeah, not right, taxes. Right, yeah, exactly. I think the, the, the important thing coming out of all this, though, is, is that you know, when you look at energy efficiency going forward in the transportation field, we'll be able to reduce our emissions, you know, the vast majority of it, 50 to 60 percent on technology. But the underlying change that still has to happen to get us to 100 percent is land use. And if the land uses don't change, if they're not mixed use and they don't have a transportive system that actually supports mixed use development, we can't reduce the length of the trip. If we can't reduce the length of the trip, right, to smaller, then we have problems with how we move people. So <clears throat> we're going to get there, right, and, and really the VMT and the road user fee and congestion pricing tooling is all an outgrowth of the fact that transportation was never created as a utility, like water, like sewer, like electricity, like your phone. It was never a utility. So the outgrowth of what we see on the ground now is because it was completely divorced from that conversation. So really where we're moving here is how do you create transportation as a utility? In other countries, certainly, they're yeah. very much utility. Yes. Is that kind of what NACTO wants, is more utility? Use? Uh, well, I, th I think cost um, efficiency. Yeah, I think I think one of the issues um, in government is always aligning the co the um, fee charging, we call it a tax, um, <laughs> with the benefits, so that when someone, uh, it's almost like being a customer. It's like if you paid whatever a dollar for you know a pack of gum, then you got the gum. They didn't say actually that you're subsidizing someone else's pack of gum. We're just giving you one little piece. You know, they don't do that, or they don't say like, well, you actually you just have to pay ten dollars to enter the store. And then, depending on the, your, you know, what you're going to do in the store, you may or may not end up with a pack of gum. You know, um, so, <laughs> so we so really get a piece of gum or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, like th there's, you know, we really want to kind of match these things up, um, ideally. And if everybody drives everywhere, then the gas tax is perfect because every time I drive a mile, it kind of is like whatever. It's about a penny, I guess, or maybe a penny and a half, depending on state you're in, um, that goes in. Uh, through your gas, you know, your, the, what you pay for the gas to pay for the roads. But um, now we're kind of moving away from that system. We have multimodal systems. You know, you really have to think about like, okay, people invest a lot of time. Time is worth a lot of money to people. Um, so that's actually their, probably their biggest investment right now in their travel choices. Um, and then the gas tax isn't that much, but you don't want to have professionals seeing it as a perverse incentive. Like if only people drove more in New York State, New York State would get more money back from the federal government. This is one of the perverse, bizarre things living in New York. We ride too much transit. You know, it's like people are like, the what? You know, what about climate change? What about this? So, you know, it's really trying to get to a better alignment between all those things um, so that people want to, uh, are willing to pay the fee because they know what they're getting. 
um, or whatever it is, or it becomes a utility and just like being, you know, paying into the water system, um, you pay into the road system, you know, things like that, you know, making sure that it, it matches up at the end of the day. So Lynn, can you give an example of a, a project that you've worked on with uh, the cities, the, the regional areas, that's been a good example of collaboration? Um, since I've been uh, in the state of Washington, the majority of my time has been spent on emergency situations. <laughs> <laughs> so the sixth week, the Skagit River Bridge went down on I-5, and my first reaction coming from being a former city councilor and Clackamas, or a county commissioner is, oh, holy cow, I-5 is gonna be through this little town. So the first thing we did after the press conference, you know, is we talked, we sat down, we talked with the city and the county local uh, officials and their transportation directors. And I said, here's the deal. You're gonna have I-5 through here. We're gonna be with you every moment of every day on the ground. It's gonna be real time. If something's not working, we're gonna change it. And, and in the end, if, there, if we totally basically flub up your entire transportation system. I mean, the pavement is gonna get ground into dirt, right? Having all these trucks come through, we're gonna come through and repave. We're gonna make you whole in the end. And we worked really hard to make sure that we reduced the time that we were impacting them. So it was, it was, um, it was a 33 days to getting up a uh, temporary bridge. And uh, that helped. <laughs> that helped. Um, and then in the case of the, uh, the, the slide, the Oso slide, um, where uh, 46 people uh, were uh, uh, killed. Uh, it was the attention to detail with the communities of making sure that they had us there, every single person in Washtot at the top there in an isolated community where it was taking us five hours one way to get to their community, to be at their community meetings every night to make sure that they had what they needed and then just to do the common sense thing and not let liability and um, uh, the lawyers get in the way and just go do it to make sure that they had what they needed. Um, so it, it, on the emergency side of things, uh, we're doing, we're, 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 we kick ass and I think that's true with all of us. Um, I think it's the uh, day to day, how do we start redefining that problem with them differently? And we haven't had the time yet uh, in Washington State to actually delve into that because we've been so focused on a past list of projects. So we're using the past list of projects to really start the conversations and go back in and say, okay, we probably can't afford to do this until there's a transportation package, this product, but what if we could give you something tomorrow out of the maintenance budget? And they're like, okay, we'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> So that's where we're at right now. Did you actually say we kick ass when it comes yeah. to emergency? <laughs> then, yeah. And then, yes. then that's true. Would you agree? Absolutely. She kicks ass and I kick ass. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah, I am too. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. Um, so a lot of examples jump to mind. I think one that is only beginning is a really interesting one. So we've certainly had our share of you know, marathon bombings and yes. you know tragedies and incidents and accidents that we've worked together with. That, Boston and other cities, but there's one I think that's really exciting. It's only starting. So there's 100 acres of land in a neighborhood called Alston Brighton in Boston. It is the largest untapped uh, land left in the city of Boston. It is an old rail yard, essentially. Harvard University owns uh, much of it. They bought it up over time, but it is completely vacant. And CSX, a large freight railroad, uh, vacated the property about two years ago. And we've been going through a major visioning session with the city and 50, I pointed like 55, talk about an unwieldy group, 55 advocates in a room. Uh, but it has worked out really well. Uh, we have committed to re, um, uh, essentially realigning our turnpike road, taking around all these spaghetti ramps out, uh, creating a real neighborhood with a transit station uh, for uh, diesel multiple unit service on our commuter rail line. And then, then talking to the city and Harvard and the neighborhood and saying, and now this is a real blank canvas of about probably 70 acres you can develop, and let's, let's think about what that can be. Um, I think that's one of the most exciting projects, frankly, that's uh, ongoing in our state uh, because you just don't have that kind of an opportunity in a major metropolitan area of 100 acres of, of a blank canvas. And really being able to remake 
it from a streetscape perspective. I mean, we're down to where the cycle tracks are going to go and how the transit connection works and, and whether our levels of service, or one or two way streets, and um, it is really, really exciting. That's where you're going to put the cycle track. That, mm -hmm. among other things, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, well, that one we're going to put in because I think we're we're paying for that, right, Pete? Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> smiling. He's like, yes, you are. And that's a four hundred. That's a four hundred million dollar state project alone, just on the infrastructure build out, and that it can really re recreate a new neighborhood. So, uh, yes, we often spend a lot of time on you know you know bridge malfunctioning or you know massive projects we have to uh, accomplish without quickly without disrupting traffic. But I think in this instance, there's a real opportunity. So maybe NACTA will come in a few years to Boston and see uh, what this you know, project can really, can really be. So uh, that's the kind of collaboration I, that we've very much enjoyed with, uh, with our partners um, in, in Massachusetts. No. Well, I mean, we collaborate on uh, almost every project that we build because uh, that's the only way you're going to be able to get a project uh, built anymore. And again, it, it, we need to get beyond collaborating to funding the project and collaborating on how we deliver the project, but collaboration on what the right project is, not only with local cities and counties and MPOs, but also the community. Um, and there's probably several examples. I think certainly we've come a long way from where we used to be in working with the city of San Francisco on the 101 um, and our attitude towards that 101 versus what the city wants to do within the city of San Francisco with bus rapid transit and, uh, and bicyclists and then how our highway that goes through that goes. I think it's a, you know, it's, it, we still are advancing um, our collaboration there. I'll give you one example, and it's actually a pretty rural example. Um, actually east of the Sierras in a small town uh, called Bridgeport. We were doing a repaving project on 395 uh, which is just basically repaving the project, uh, repaving the road and upgrading the condition of it. And then we were going to put back, uh, like we typically do, exactly what was there before we were going to do the repaving. Now, for some context, this is on 395. North and south of this, for miles and miles and miles, is a two-lane highway. Um, and, and motorists look for every opportunity to pass a slower vehicle at any given time. Well, when they get into the city, that's actually where the four lanes were. So now you have a rural setting in a small town that the motorists going through that town are actually using those four lanes as the passing opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Which was not conducive with what the community really wanted. I believe this conversation actually started up after we had you know, programmed the project and were about to start construction, maybe even awarded the contract. They said, we want something different than what is there today. And in a very short amount of time, we lessened that to three lanes, one lane in each direction with a passing lane, and then we added parking, actually a very innovative parking solution. It was diagonal parking, but it was back-end parking, and I don't, you'll have to look it up and see it. It didn't work right away. People were doing all sorts of stuff, but they figured it out. But the collaboration between the State Department of Transportation and the small community about, look, this is what's going to serve our needs while you're coming in to rehabilitate the pavement and preserve the pavement, extend the life of the pavement and serve your needs, let's talk. And there was a very short amount of time to be able to do that. That is scalable to larger projects and we have done that on larger projects. But I think that's one example of how collaboration to get the right solution with the community, the local, uh, the local jurisdiction as well as the State Department of Transportation. How would you all change national policy to help facilitate doing all the things that you need to do? You know, I, th I think that there's a seed change going on, and uh, while there are, uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, any federal rules or regulations. I think it's actually that there are a lot of a lot of policies in place, and even AASHTO, we all know the Green Book actually has the flexibility in it um, that kind of rules our world. It has the flexibility in it. It was just that we have narrowed uh, those in order to uh, have some predictability in the products that we've put out on the road based on safety and liability. And so I would say it it's goes right back to the retraining and the data that we have now that we didn't have in 1956. It's the retraining of all of the individuals from the top to the bottom of what does it mean to be safe and where that liability actually doesn't apply. I mean, in terms of, uh, 
getting it, it was beat into my head as a, as a beginning entry level engineer, both in the university and in uh, Wisconsin DOT, you follow the standards or you are liable. And retraining folks to understand that you cannot blindly apply standards and expect that it's gonna be safe and that you are not liable, that, that's a giant myth that, that is really hard to retrain. And so we have a giant ask in our budget going forward for training on this issue um, from the state legislature. And it's gonna be an uphill push to get it because funds are being restricted. But it's the only way to actually allow people the space to be engineers and planners again. Um, so giving them back that empowerment is gonna be, is gonna be difficult because they were trained to do the opposite. Richard. If I could get my governor to run for president, that would help. Um, no. Um, you know, so I have a lot of reflections, unfortunately, at the federal level. Um, I think my favorite saying of all, that Tip O'Neill used to say, which is there's no such thing as a Democratic or Republican pothole. Mm -hmm. They all have to be filled. You wouldn't know that uh, with what is going on in Washington right now, but you know, if infrastructure is a place that can't find some common ground, God knows what uh, can be. So I'm sure we could have a, a whole week about the politics in, in Washington. But it's just, it's very, very disheartening that we're not seeing any kind of, um, it doesn't even need to be unanimity, but certainly some kind of uh, approach uh, when it comes to transportation, given what I said, that there is no such thing as a Democratic Republican party. Uh, with that said, that's why I think NACTO, uh, getting back to NACTO, is so relevant, because I firmly believe that this is the century of the city. And uh, unfortunately, at the federal level, I, we can all prognosticate about what we think is going to happen, but I can't see anything happening in the next few election cycles of any kind of uh, relevance. Um, so we'll lurch from budget to budget, crisis to crisis, and not solve anything. And at least I think at the state and at the city level, the mega city level and the mega region level, there's a lot more cooperation and collaboration that's occurring. And the most interesting stuff happening I think are in big cities and in states. So, um, you know, I urge the folks in this room to continue that work because it is, in my opinion, going to be the most relevant and moving, I think, uh, for us um, in the future. But it's the federal level, it's just, I, and I, you, the USDOT folks are excellent, by the way. I shouldn't say, you know, from Secretary Fox and his team, we've worked really closely with them. I know many of you have as well. They're very good people who work hard, but. We just have a political process right now that cannot see, it seems to me, that a place like transportation um, is really about jobs and quality of life. And somehow it is beyond our leaders to be able to find a way to come together and, and at least agree on some of those, those principles. It's very disheartening to me. Malcolm, are you hoping to get your governor to run for president? My well? governor has run for president. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question as opposed to <coughs> comment on that. I, I mean, I would echo uh, what was said before about uh, it would be really nice to see some uh, uh, recognition at the federal level of the importance of transportation as opposed to the bipartisanship. Mm. Um, and, you know, what really is important to a lot of people and high on everybody's radar, not only politicians, but people that you know, living in the United States is safety and um, health and, uh, you know, all those things, but transport and jobs and the economy, but transportation is so integral with all those things at the top of the polling list and we end up in the middle of the pack. So the easy answer is give us more money and, and leave us alone and less restrictions. Um, and, and that would be true at the city level, that would be true at the county level, it's true at the state level. Um, but I'll offer up one perspective that there is an opportunity that we may control. And I agree that the people at uh, USDOT are fabulous to work with, but we still have some stovepipes that the federal agencies are in. Federal Transit Agency, Federal mm -hmm. Rail Agency, and the Federal Highway Administration are still stovepiped, and their dollars have to be used for certain scopes of work. And as my administrator in California once said, they're in their cylinders of excellence and they don't want to get out of their cylinders of excellence. <laughs> Those dollars coming from the feds, the states and the cities and the counties may see better use from a transportation perspective for those dollars, but they're still kind of painted a certain color. And I think there's an opportunity, we do have an opportunity to try to address that going forward. 
what's the best investment of every dollar from a transportation standpoint to, to improve transportation, enhance the economy, and improve livability? It may not be this money going to federal highways. We, you know, we need to kind of, from the project delivery standpoint as well as an investment standpoint, I think we can break down those cylinders a little bit at the state, at the federal level. We are working hard to do it mm -hmm. at the state and local level, and that's one opportunity I think we may have to work on. That's a great point. You know, this, and just to <coughs> drive home that point of it, it different, <clears throat> apart from Congress acting on, on more, uh, more revenue, the administration is really pushing forward on this and, and moving the needle and helping us with performance measures rather than, uh, and, and helping us with that flexibility. Now, they're gonna have to retrain everybody that they have as well. And because it's, it, it's just, that's the way the business has been for the last 60, 70 years, right? So um, they, are, they are really pushing and I really appreciate that push internal to the administration of the knobs that they control, they, they are moving the needle and they are allowing us, the question is will the states take the flexibility? And I, I'm just going to add to that, um, and you guys are all great. <laughs> the one thing I always wish but, um, but, but. The coming <laughs> when uh, I was working at the city is that sometimes the state would get out of the way sure. um, because in the federal highway program, the state is the state is the middleman on all the money, mm -hmm. and one of the problems with that we talked a little bit about a liability earlier, and so the state then feels liable for stuff that the city wants. And so the city, so the, the state feels like it has to say no to the city because it's, it's going to be on the hook at the end of the day. Um, and it's, it, it sets up a bad dynamic, I think, because what you really don't want is to get, like, there, whenever there's a project that's moving through the process, there's somebody on the ground that really wants it. There's neighbors, maybe it's the mayor, maybe it's city council members. They really want it. They're putting pressure on the DOT, the city, um, to deliver that thing. And then there's this whole chain of people outside of that realm that um, get pulled into it, and it sets up a negative dynamic that I think um, contributes, you know, large projects aside, <laughs> you know, uh, to some of the bad uh, feelings <laughs> about the agencies. And I don't think it's necessary because at, at the end of the day, like right now, we're getting to a point um, where the original structure of the federal program which was around building the interstate and like making sure even in you know Wyoming people knew how to build an interstate isn't really needed you know like I think we're we've really gotten to a great place as a profession so I think that we could um, have direct aid for cities that's what we call it um, <laughs> once states have signed off on it <laughs> be nice. Um, and uh, the, the one other thing I'll say is I think that um, I, I do appreciate the work with USDOT we've um, been working with them also closely on all the the executive side stuff, and they've done a great job on that. And I just really want to also say, Federal Highway has also endorsed the Street Design Guide and the Bike Design Guide, and that's been really helpful, I think, for all the cities and all the states also moving forward. So it's been great. So we're reaching the end of our forum here, and I just want to give uh, all of our panelists one last opportunity to get their most important message uh, across to the group today uh, in 30 seconds or less. Go. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting to see at least three states represented up here talking about land development, talking about uh, multimodal transit, bikes, peds, and those things. And I think that that does reflect uh, some of the change that's afoot in many of the states that have, uh, uh, you know, urban centers and that type of thing. In California, we've updated our, uh, our, our mission statement to try to reflect that and what we're, what we're trying to accomplish, and that's a safe, sustainable, interconnected and efficient transportation system that improves the economy and livability and it's really the how we do it and why and the why is the economy and quality of life or livability. Richard. You're only as good as your last rush hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's your message. <laughs> Thank you mom. Um, so no I, I think it goes back to um, why I think NACTO is so relevant and that is given the vacuum of leadership that we've talked about in a couple of different places I think this is a place at a time where cities can contribute significantly to quality of life and to get, I think, other national leaders to understand that the work has to continue, notwithstanding the, the political challenges that we have. Um, so I would just encourage you, I, I think the future is bright for NACTO uh, and all the work that you're doing um, in your local cities for sure. And I just want to thank you for that. Uh, we're, I think all of transportation is in transition. And then I, I think that uh, the 200 years ago we were building canals, 
150 years ago, we were building out a rail system. 50, 60 years ago, we were building out an interstate. We have a robust city, state transportation system now, and now we're trying to figure out how to tweak it and maximize it. And changing that mentality is hard. It's, it's very difficult because it, it, to a lot it feels like a failure that we're not continuing to build these massive projects, but even tweaks to the system, like a two mile tunnel <laughs> in downtown Seattle, <coughs> is expensive and it's, it's major. And we learned a lot from the big day. So um, the, the, I think just recognizing that we're all in transition and this is going to be the most exciting time, I think, in transportation history. And to take advantage of that and really galvanize and excite people about it um, because it, it's not a failure. It's not a failure. It is an opportunity. And so taking, you know, I'm just going to say we're the most multimodal state, DOT, until somebody corrects me. Um, and so that's how, corrected. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, that's, that's what I'm trying to galvanize is, you know, our internal folks should be extremely proud of the multimodal that we already have under our belt and to maximize that out. Well, um, I'm just going to briefly say I'm so excited to be here with uh, state DOTs that are competing about who is more multimodal. <laughs> Yay, right? Yay! <laughs> um, and I just think it's really great, and I, I feel like we're really coming together around this new model of transportation, as you guys were discussing, and I'm really excited to be here and be a part of it. So thanks, everyone. In, in fairness, NACTO told me Wednesday night I was the most multimodal. <laughs> <laughs> One opinion. <laughs> Wait till next week. <laughs> <laughs> Can we all agree that they all kick ass? <laughs> <laughs> all right.